Becoming an ethical counselor or therapist is a self-reflective process that requires a great deal of personal awareness, insight, and increasing clarity on what your values, priorities, and motivations are. Practicing ethically requires more than knowledge of facts and rules, but a strong sense of who you are and how you will uniquely approach counseling. Whether or not you'll end up in the counseling profession yourself, I encourage you to give non-judgmental attention to your own reactions, attitudes, and opinions as you interact with this material. In this presentation, you'll be introduced to two categories of ethical practice, mandatory and aspirational, and Kohlberg's stages of moral development. I'm hoping you'll see how important it is that counselors or therapists are always paying attention to their own growth and maturity. Next, I'll show you six basic moral principles that serve as the foundation for counseling codes of ethics and encourage ethical counseling practice. Finally, you'll be invited to reflect on the intersection between counseling theory and ethics in counseling. I want to encourage you to consider the strengths and limitations of different theories for ethical practice. An ethic in counseling is a system of rules and principles that help us decide what's okay and not okay in professional counseling. You can broadly categorize ethical practice in the counseling profession in two categories, mandatory and aspirational. The first, a mandatory ethic, is about following the rules established by counselor organizations and governing bodies. The second, an aspirational ethic, is about the spirit of the law, where a counselor has internalized basic moral principles and can consider best practices with more depth and nuance. To help us, let's briefly explore the work of Lawrence Kohlberg and his model of moral development. In this model, Kohlberg describes how individuals develop in their moral reasoning. The model has to do less with the final decisions we make or actions we choose, and more to do with how we think about issues of right and wrong. Kohlberg's stages of moral development describe the different kinds of logic and processes we use to make moral decisions. The six stages of Kohlberg's moral development model can be broken down into three categories or levels with two stages each. For the sake of brevity, we won't go any further than these three levels. The first level is called pre-conventional, in which individuals, most often children, make decisions based on the direct and external consequences they experience, such as particular punishments and rewards. Reasoning is focused then on the self and how to increase reward and minimize punishment. The second level is called conventional, and this is a sort of adolescent or slightly more socially oriented version of the pre-conventional stage. Morality is still dictated by an outside force, but this time the outside force is not a parent or authority figure, but the rules, norms, and conventions of society. At this level, the concern is about what's best for both self and others. Individuals at the conventional level of moral development might make decisions with reasoning that is focused on what is required for social or group belonging. Developmental psychologists have argued that much of the adult population plateaus at this level of moral development and never goes any further. However, there is a third level in Kohlberg's stage model that is called post-conventional. In this level of moral reasoning, individuals are more aware of the differences between what they believe as individuals and the morals that society holds for them. This level of development is sometimes called the principled level, where a person's own perspective has room to be at odds with the perspectives or rules of society at large. An individual is aware of and thinks through the tensions and conflicts between her or his own moral perspective and that of the larger society. The individual is also aware that the rules and norms of society are not perfect and also changeable. With Kohlberg's model of moral development in mind, let's go back to our discussion of mandatory and aspirational ethics. So what's the difference between a mandatory or aspirational ethic? And how do those terms help guide us into practices that honor the people we work with, practices that are ethical and respectful? Essentially, the difference between a mandatory ethic and an aspirational ethic is that in the first, a counselor is concerned 
about not getting in trouble, punishment and reward. And in the second, a counselor is concerned first and foremost with what she or he believes is best for the client. They're both important as the rules and legalities of counseling have been put into place for a reason, but notice that the first is most often much more clear-cut and easy to carry out than the second. As you mature in your moral reasoning, moral decision-making usually gets more complicated and nuanced, not less. In counseling, with some important exceptions, not getting in trouble is often pretty simple and straightforward. On the other hand, when the conversation shifts towards what is best for clients, counselors could debate, and often do, for a long time with no clear answers. All this to say, solid ethical decision-making starts with an attitude of authentic care for clients that goes beyond just abiding by rules or protecting oneself from trouble. Knowing and abiding by the rules is just the start. Making sound ethical decisions involves an appreciation of the complexity of what it really means to keep your client's best interests in mind and the hard work it actually takes to carry this out. It always requires maturity on the part of the therapist. Professional codes of ethics identify many of the specific do's and don'ts for professional helpers. In addition, six basic moral principles have been identified to help counselors strive towards an aspirational ethic as well as to help them when they are confronted with an ethical dilemma. These moral principles serve as the foundation of most formal ethics codes and can guide you when there is no easy or apparent answer to an ethical problem. The first is autonomy. The principle of autonomy charges mental health professionals to empower their clients and ensure that client self-determination is preserved. For example, when a counselor checks in with a client on a regular basis to ensure the client understands what is happening in counseling, this helps preserve the client's autonomy. A second principle is non-maleficence. This is one of the oldest tenets for medical professionals and simply means avoid doing harm. The third principle is beneficence. This refers to mental health professionals doing what they can to promote the well-being of clients and larger society or systems. You might say this principle takes the previous principle to do no harm and takes it to the next level. The fourth principle is justice. Justice is about knowing what is equitable more than just fair. To help you understand the difference, try using this analogy. Let's say a group of people comes together for dinner, but half of them have had breakfast and lunch where the other half could not, for whatever reason, have breakfast and lunch. And let's say there's a limited amount of food for the group to share for dinner. What might be fair in the simplest terms would be to give every person in the group the same amount of food. But what might be equitable would be giving the individuals who haven't had at breakfast and lunch a little more food. Justice, therefore, isn't always as simple as superficial fairness. It requires a depth of knowledge about the bigger picture, the ability to shift your frame of reference, and knowing how to contextualize the experience of another person. The fifth principle, fidelity, is about making realistic commitments and keeping your promises. Counselors are honest with clients about their limitations and do their best with the little things, like keeping their appointments and returning messages. Veracity, the final and sixth principle, is about honesty and transparency. This means being truthful with clients and colleagues and being clear about what you know and don't know and how you can or can't be helpful. Before I conclude, I want to suggest that the psychotherapeutic approach that a counselor adopts has implications for ethical practice. Certain theories and practices may have different strengths and limitations for helping you practice ethically, or they may fundamentally shape how you understand what is and isn't ethical altogether. As you learn and interact with various psychotherapeutic approaches, here are a few questions to consider as they relate to ethics. How does this theory situate the helper and client? How concerned is the approach about imbalances of power in the therapeutic relationship? And does it have ways for addressing those imbalances? Who and how are problems defined in this theory? How much say does a client have? Do the therapist and client co-construct the problem and solutions? Or does that fall more to one or the other? What implications does that have for honoring and respecting clients? 
How much transparency is there in this approach? Are clients passive participants or active collaborators? What are the implications of the theory's view of human nature for ethical practice? Within the worldview of this particular theory, what does it mean to do no harm or promote justice? Ethical counseling requires a working knowledge of mandatory ethics or the stated rules and guidelines that counselors must follow. It also goes further than that. Counselors are expected to think deeply about what it means to truly advocate for their clients. This requires an ongoing process of gaining self-awareness and maturity throughout the counselor's life and career. It also means counselors learn, internalize, and embody the six moral principles I outlined. Finally, counselors should consider the strengths and limitations of their chosen approach to therapy for ethical practice. With all these things in mind, you have a roadmap for practicing ethically, with integrity, and for showing those you work with the utmost honor and respect. Mm -hmm.